How y'all doing? For this book review, I'm going to do another El Spray de Camp book, The Stones of Nomoro. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And um, this is one of his um, um, one of his science fiction stories. Um, now, in case you're wondering, you know, for those few fans that may still be out there, this I don't think this most likely is not part of the planetary. Um, the VJ and the Planetarius is the Christian series, as I reviewed before, because uh, there's a lot of things that they don't um, um, connect with. They don't talk about the um, Earth and anyone speaking Portuguese or anything. It doesn't have much connection towards it. So it's very similar in concept of humans going out into another world. And in this place, it takes place on a planet where you have these reptilian denizens here. You know, here's a picture of one. And, you know, when I first got this book, I mean, the cover alone attracted me. It's a guy riding a dinosaur. So, figured maybe it's a sort of a dinosaur-like race, like the Osirians from the VGN and Planetarius. But, um, not so. They, you know, it's just a kind of similarities. This race right here, um, um, the Kokokians, uh, or the Kooks as they're called, uh, they, they... They've had a very long, rich history, but they still have a sort of reptilian, solid mindset. So they don't have much in way of art, but they have, they're very good. They're um, they prefer they prefer their expression, artistic and otherwise, as uh, um, oratory. And in fact, continuously throughout the book, the main character Salazar, who's an archaeologist working there, he is you know, he, he has to constantly go through the continuous rituals of, you know, of just for the greeting before they start talking. The story is the archaeologist um, Salazar. He is working on this site, and you know, again, this is not a matter of um, you know finding riches in Indiana Jones. This is good traditional archaeology. He has a few graduate students working under him. This planet, this some um, planet seems to be inhabited. About, um, had a lot of human inhabitants throughout the years, along with the indigenous um, people. Now he's coming across this problem while you know he's already having problems with the leader of that area that who he has not gotten along with. He's got a rival human who wants to turn that archaeological site into a um, ho a, a planetary resort for humans, and that would mean and his plans would be just to redirect the waterways and just flood the city that he's working on before it's fully excavated. And on the, on top of that, Salazar is hired by this man who's going to do this, you know, for a lecture of money, he figures, okay, I'll let you work as long as you can until I finally get the rights in, I'll start, you know, you'll, you could dig until the time I get started on. So it's kind of, you know, insult to injury and, you know, um, salt on the wound, as well as the fact that his ex-wife is, who is a reporter, is tagging along, who unfortunately after they split, she's been tagging along with, she's been um, with the villain for a while. Of course, the villain is a very, um, Think about dark side of Ernest Hemingway in the worst possible way. And you kind of get, you know, it might give you an idea if I had to summarize this character. You know. And so, and unfortunately, again, you know, so Salazar has got to go against, you know, this guy right here. At the same time, there's these um, nomadic warriors about to attack um, the territories that he's working on and surrounding areas. So all this is going along while he's, you know, trying to figure this out. Uh, one reviewer on the internet, on you know, Wikipedia, described uh, Salazar as a typical decamp hero, and I was starting to take notice of that because you know he's a um, either a scholarly type or you know well knowledgeable guy, but capable. Although he never says himself, it's not like John Carter of Mars or Tarzan and all that. He's just a guy who could, he does what he can, you know, you know, to get the job done. Now I will admit, as far as character goes, I found him not the most likable. What I mean is, is that um, in the beginning we find out about his early relationship. Salazar, who was married um, before, he leaves her with a younger woman. They and, and, his, and by leaving his wife, he also left his son, who commits suicide. And with that fact early on, throughout the book, he's been um, trying to make his moves, um, trying to convince her again. She is steadfast against it because she doesn't want to complicate things as they are, you know, with who she... What you know, who who she went with after they split, uh, the events that's going on and everything. So I, I think she's playing it smart. If they just simply split because he left for a woman, they had no child. I would probably see why he wants to go back because he made a mistake. But what after their son, I just cannot see a person without somebody telling him that you kind of you know, especially after the death of your son, aren't you just being um, 
being kind of selfish a bit. I do find him a bit selfish. Now, I'm not going to explain, not going to, um, explain the ending and what happens to these two. You're going to have to read to find out. But I didn't think it was a, you know, just shows he wasn't the best character, despite all his um, merits that he has. Although, yes, I do think that, you know, he has learned his lesson by, you know, by he made a huge mistake leaving in the first place, and not he doesn't want to do that again. But with that said, I mean, it's a good typical DeCamp story where the hero is not the military type, not like John Carter, not like Tarzan or Conan or all that. He is a an educated man. He's an archaeologist trying to do his job. He's caught in the politics and, you know, his previous um, relationships and all that, and he does what he can to solve it. So... And I notice this pattern on many characters that Sprague to Camp is done. They have, they, um, they kind of have, you know, there's, you know, overall pattern. The Hostage of Zir is one from the Vigen into Planetarius. One of his fantasies I noticed is, uh, well, the Pixelated Purist is this very similar to, um, similar to that. I'm sure if I look, uh, look into it more, I'll probably find more of that. So there you go. Uh, you know, classic science fiction. Um, oh, by the way, this is not, not just L. Sprite Camp. It's Catherine Crook. Um, I'm sorry, Crook to Camp. That is his wife. Many of it, I think it looks like many of his later novels he wrote them with his wife. Again, like the Pixel A. Pyrrhus. Uh, this one is not the old 50s or 60s. This one, let me check. 88. I, I was eight years old when this came out. And you can tell by the artwork. It feels like something you would see in the um, Isaac Asimov magazine at the time. So there you go. You want a you know, different turn of science fiction about an archaeologist all just working on an alien planet, give it a go. Stones and Morrow, um, from one of the legends of Bell's, you know, legend science fiction, El Sprite Camp, who I encourage people should read more. <clears throat> because if you don't find him on the bookshelves on Barnes Noble or anything, you know, you gotta go to used bookstores, and that's if you're lucky. So maybe with videos like this, I can, you know, encourage people to look into classic authors like that. Because you can still find Asimov, you can still find, um, you know, Robbery Highland, and they left their mark, and they deserve to be there, but, you know, there are many others at the time where, yes, the, you know, they've made their mark too, but no one reads them anymore. No one produces them anymore. So there you go. Stones and Morrow, Ellsbury DeCamp, and Catherine Kirk DeCamp. Give it a go. Thank you all for watching. You have a nice day.